You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year ten. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the twenty-third to the twenty-sixth, if I'm not mistaken. Ah,、uh, actually, I think it's the twenty-fourth to the twenty-seventh. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So, well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So. What have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and is that the campsite in the Lake District? No, actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night, and they told me that if we had over fifty children, which we do, they could give us a further ten percent off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. Okay. So now these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes. Go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around seven on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare, and that children love. Yes, 
Then, lights out would be at 9.30, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation in a bank. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning. I'd like to open a bank account, please. Good morning. What kind of account do you want to open? I'm not sure. Perhaps you can give me some suggestions. I only want to deposit money in the bank and pay all kinds of bills easily. Fine. I've got the application form here. First of all, can I have your full name, please? Richard Lee. Fine, Richard. What's your occupation? I'm studying a doctor's degree now, although I was a dentist before coming here. Well, so you are a student. What kind of account can you suggest for me? How about a deposit account? What's the difference between that and a current account? There are many differences such as the interest rate, overdraft and service, and so on. Fine. I will take your recommendation. OK. Let's talk about the main two account cards of the deposit account. Fine. One card is called the Solo Card, and the other one is named MasterCard. Which one is better for me? Let me introduce you to some differences of the two cards. OK. The first one is annual interest rate. Which one is higher? Of course, it is the MasterCard. At present, its rate is 5.5%, 5 .5%, 
but the solo card is only 2.5%. Now look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. How about the other differences? The service supplied with the two cards. Could you speak specifically? We usually supply internet service and mobile service with all of the cards, of course, including the solo card. Yes, I'd like to ask for the service of mobile and... Uh, does Solo Card have an overdraft? I'm sorry, but Mastercard has such a service. Fine. If you want to take more money out of the bank than you have in it, be very careful. You should not do this without the bank's permission, and you will have to pay some charge. Do you mean interest? No, I mean the overdraft charge. How much is that charge? According to the bank's rules, the minimum fee is about 2%. Fine. The last item of the two cards is the requirement. There is no limitation of the solo card, but if you want to get MasterCard, you should deposit a minimum sum of £1,500 in the first time. Oh, what's the requirement of money? What do you mean? I mean I cannot deposit cash when I open a bank account. Don't worry. We accept cash and cheque or even money order. Great. So which card did you decide to open? I'd like to open the MasterCard. A good choice. How often would you like to receive your statement? Monthly, please. OK. The last one you should know is the opening time. Banks usually open from 9 a.m., until 4.30 p.m., from Monday to Friday. But most branches open until 3.30 p.m. on Saturdays. OK, I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two faculty directors talking about which person in their university to promote. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, we've got to decide who to promote to leading education officer. Someone from the arts faculty, I suppose. Well, it can be from any faculty, since the position requires more general skills. Handling personnel, settling disputes and motivating them to focus on the task. It was the last position which involved computer knowledge, not this one. Surely computer knowledge would help. So too would knowledge in the arts. Sure, it would help. But the key criterion is being able to direct the staff appropriately. So it doesn't matter then from which faculty we select our candidates? 
Not really, but I've already looked at those from computing and rejected them all. Why? They're all too new, lacking in sufficient experience. Whereas these ones from the business faculty are long timers, so we'll take someone from there. I suppose you're right. The arts faculty doesn't present much in the way of suitable candidates either. But we'll still have to train the person, teach the ropes, as they say, and he or she will have to expect to do overtime as needed. Of course, it can get so busy that if we were open on the weekend, they'd have to work then as well. Just as well, we're a Monday to Friday university, right? Right, but are you sure these people will actually want the job? The salary isn't such an improvement on their current ones. I know, but there are benefits. You get overtime rates, a nice place to put your car, as well as additional petrol money if you drive for company purposes, which they'll probably be required to do. But those benefits are quite limited, especially given all the work and responsibility involved. People often don't like that. They prefer the creative freedom of less senior teaching positions. Yeah, I know. But these candidates should realise that if they do this job well, there'll be more promotions down the line. You know how everyone likes having their own office, right? Sure. Well, that would come after a few years if they're prepared to work hard and grow with the university. Yes, that should attract these people. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Well, that's enough talk about the job. What about the actual candidates? How many do we have? Ah,、uh, I've narrowed it down to four. Ah,、uh, just using their first names. That's Stephen, Abdul, Lek, and Oscar. As you said, there's quite a bit of experience between them, about thirty-four years in all. What's the exact breakdown of figures? Abdul and Stephen both have seven years. Lek has one more, and Oscar is the most experienced at twelve. But who's the most qualified? Stephen and Abdul have an MBA.、Oh, sorry, Abdul's got something called a MBP, some foreign thing which translates as Master of Business Practice. I'm not sure what that is, but does he do the job well? Very well, apparently. Better than Lek and Oscar, who hold a degree and some certificates, respectively. But we have to think about any drawbacks, you know, possible issues with any of them. I asked the respective deans for feedback, and I found out that Stephen, the younger one, drinks a bit. So he has a problem with alcohol? No, he never drinks to excess, but at the bar he's often expressed his intention of moving on, of teaching abroad. Ah, he's not stable. Not stable at all, apparently. We'll never know for how long he'll hold the job. We need stable personnel. And people without family problems or sick relatives, like the last guy we promoted. What about Abdul then? Will he do? He might do, except his English language ability is limited. It's functional but a bit broken, and meaning is sometimes lost. That's not the problem with the next candidate, Lek, who has good language ability. But this job involves handling people, and his dean says Lek's attitude is bad. In what way? His manners are okay, and he's interested in his job, but he believes there should always be adequate leisure in life. He definitely won't work overtime, and complains a lot already about his job. But this last candidate, Oscar, is probably not the right one either. Why not? Not another problem with language. His first language isn't English, but he speaks it well enough. He's stable with a good attitude, but his age is the problem. Age is not a problem. That would be ageism. And I don't believe in that. But with his age comes health problems as well, and serious ones at that. Oh, that might be an issue then. The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the conversation between Andrew and Samantha. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions. Does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community as when bills aren't paid, or contracted work isn't completed, or neighbours disagree. At other times, it's to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But food's not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. Y you can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here, you can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. <laughs> With those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realise they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who has exactly that problem. Oh, uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.